fight and we don't have to kill everybody in the whole wide world really just needs to chill no we don't have to fuss no 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 we don't have to hey everybody welcome back to another episode of just chill with oliver george episode 35 now and i have a great guest in store for you but as always before we get to that i want to remind you if you are watching me right now on youtube and you would prefer an audio only version for whatever reason you can get that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. Vice versa to that, if you're listening to me right now and you didn't realize there was a visual side to this show, please come check it out on YouTube. However you choose to enjoy the episode, though, please subscribe, follow, like, share, whatever the case may be on that respective platform that you're using. It really does help me reach more cool people like you and to grow the show that I've been building from the ground up. So if you've already subscribed, thank you so much. It really does mean a lot to me. Finally, if you want to contact the show for whatever reason, maybe you've got a cool guest idea or just some general feedback, it's just chill podcasting at gmail.com. I should also point out this episode is going up on December 21st, 2020. So depending on when you are watching or listening to this, I just wanted to say happy holidays to you and your family. Hopefully you're healthy and everybody's looking forward to a, a better 2021 because everyone knows 2020 was a flaming bag of dog shit. Um, Anyways, enough with all that. Let's get to the man of the hour, as I usually say. My guest for this episode was the awesome Sebi Kluwer. If you're not familiar with him, he's an award-winning director, producer, writer. He was involved in all six seasons of the legendary show Kenny vs. Spenny. And he's actually still working on another great show right now called Still Standing on the CBC. If you have not heard of that, please go check it out. It's got a great concept and execution and is very funny, so I think you'll enjoy it. Another cool thing about this episode, I was able to include fan questions. I reached out to you guys on the Kenny vs. Spenny Facebook fan page, and you had a ton of great questions, and I tried to fit in as many as I could into this interview, and Sebi had a lot of great answers for you. So strap in for some behind-the-scenes hilarity and all the stories he had to share with me, and I I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Thank you. Um, Yo, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm surprised, frankly. No one ever wants to talk to uh, me behind the scenes. Not that I crave it or anything, but it's, um, yeah, no, thank you. Oh, it's dude, cool. you'll be surprised because I, I actually took to the fan group to try to get some fan questions and I, there was too many. So uh, we'll get to that in a bit. But uh, I actually wanted to kind of start out just knowing a little bit more about your youth and actually getting into film because I had read online that you got, you had like a Super 8 camera when you were 11 years old. So this has been like in your blood since you were a little guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I always liked film. And when I was a kid, I, um, I was in the big brother program cause, uh, my dad was a little, whatever he's on his own trip at the time. And, okay. uh, my big brother was in the film industry and he used to bring me out to sets and stuff. And I was really inter- interested at the time. I'm not sure why or how, but I guess in my mind, um, if you're going to work in the industry, you should know every aspect of it. And I remember reading, you know, these film magazines as a kid and like, Oh, Spielberg used to shoot his own films and, I figured, you know, if I wanted to be a director, you kind of, I kind of had to learn how to shoot as well. Yeah, um, makes sense. I guess I later learned a lot of directors don't know how to shoot. It's very interesting. <laughs> it doesn't mean they're they're not very good, but at the time, it just seemed like okay, this is what you got to do. You got to tool up, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I went to like film camp when I was like a kid, uh, like 11, 12, 13 years old. I was really into theaters. You know, I was like a stage crew nerd in high school. Um, but yeah, I was always like in my blood and like you know, because I've known Kenny my whole life, like I was always into photography as well as sort of like a way to sort of privately get better without being dependent on anybody else. Like you could just go out with a camera and do whatever you want. I could just like go to the door, go to Chinatown, go to like Toronto's industrial East end and just shoot some, you know, crazy stuff out there. And just, it was just sort of a way for me to, to hone it, I guess, you know? So. That's awesome though. I mean, because not everybody has that from such a young age, really focused on what they want to do. So it's awesome that you were able to carry through on that into adulthood and be the awesome, you know, award-winning director and, and filmmaker that you are. Um, and you went to Ryerson too, right? I did. I went to Ryerson. I mean, it's, uh, I took a couple of years off of high school, went to Germany and traveled around Europe a lot, took a lot of pictures. First time I went, Kenny gave me like 40 rolls of like shitty, expo- like expired film, like he was always like nurturing me like a big brother that way. And it's That's like, awesome. so I went to, went to Europe, took a bunch of photographs, most of them unusable. But then when I came back, I was like, so like raring to go to school. And I've, I guess in hindsight, you know, you, 
I'm not sure I needed to go. I, I learned a lot, but it was a chance for me to kind of like make stupid mistakes and experiment a lot. But um, Kenny, he had just come out of the new media program at Ryerson. Like, I guess when it was still a college, he was like, you got to do new media. It's like, you get everything, you get all the film equipment, you get all the photography stuff and the computer stuff. And he's like, in your application, you got to say something about giving back to Canadian culture. Cause the last thing they want are people coming in saying, I want to go and make Hollywood movies. You know what I mean? So true, yeah. it was great advice and it's true. And I, I do actually believe that. But at the time, you know, when I was like a kid, I was like, you know, you don't know what you're getting into. And you know, that guidance definitely helped me out. But yeah, I did Ryerson for four years. Definitely like always focused on the film video aspect of stuff. And it was, it was a, it was a valuable experience. I think the theory stuff really paid off like history of propaganda and German cinema and film theory and like Crazy. script writing classes and all this stuff. And it's, it's interesting in Canada, like you really, it's not like the U S if you want to be successful in the industry. I mean, definitely there's some people that have done amazingly well, like a very small percentage at a young age, but you really do have to pay your dues here. It seems like, no one wants to hire a 22 year old director. Whereas in the States, it's like the cool thing. It's like, oh, it's like we got Kevin this, Smith like, makes clerks. And then, you know, yeah. 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 I have a friend who did like there. 90210 when he was like in his 20s. Amazing mm. opportunity. But you would never get that in Canada ever. You have to like really pay your dues big time. Yeah. So, definitely. It's a different yeah. system for sure. Spenny was talking about that when he came on the show um, back in August, just how different things are in film between Canada and the US. It's just different worlds. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like, I think that's another thing I growing up, like I li used to live in um, the St. Lawrence market neighborhood. Like when I was a kid, like in, in government subsidized housing. And we used to see like them filming the police Academy movies and short circuit and all these like eighties movies were being shot in our neighborhood. And I used to see it all the time. And I was like, fuck, this is like, this is something I can do. This is around me. Not realizing at the time, these are American productions and that <laughs> I think the the idea of, of what you can do in the film industry in Canada is not at all what you think it is. It's like, I think in Canada, you can have a very successful television career. If you're going to get into film, it can be incredibly brutal. I mean, it's you have to apply for funding. Not you don't in television, but it's like a really ruthless industry. And like, look, you can make a great film here. You're lucky to get it in like three theaters for like more than a week. And then it's gone, you know, it, it's, it's not sort of soul crushing, but I did intentionally, <laughs> like when I was younger, I, I always wanted to work in film. And I, I got to, I guess when I was coming out of Ryerson, I was like, okay, this is not a, a viable career choice. So, and television was blowing up in the early 2000s, when, which is kind of when I started professionally. And, and reality kind of TV was blown up as well. Yeah. 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 And it, you know, every episode of any show I've ever worked at, I've always looked at as a mini film and it's like, and it's true. It's, it's still story storytelling. It's still a visual medium. It's still like very, like I f feel very gratified and really fortunate. So. Well, and yeah. some of the, the big U S stuff these days, episodes of shows do feel like film, even from a, like a production oh, standpoint, look at the Mandalorian. It's like, Holy shit. You know how much money yeah, went into this one way. episode. Um, I think in the eighties and nineties, there's a lot of beta cam on the shoulder type of shows. And it was really like low five. But now it's like, it's amazing. Like it's, it's almost a preferred medium with, cinema being so over the barrel right now with yeah you know, all the definitely yeah um i uh before i get to some of the kenny versus spenny stuff i wanted to mention a show that you've worked on that i didn't know about um i almost feel like a bad canadian because it's a cbc thing but uh i wanted to talk about it because i doubt a lot of the other kenny versus spenny guys might you know not be aware that you did this um it's still standing and it's i got like six seasons and i started watching some like clips on youtube last night and it's a great show uh, it is actually awards and so I don't know if you could just sort of explain the show for for people that might not be aware of it. Um, Still Standing is basically a comic, Johnny Harris, who uh, he goes to small towns that are on the ropes about to, you know, going through some sort of uh, cultural economic crisis. Gets to know some locals and does like a live stand up comedy show about the town for the town. And so like with that show, like we go to a town like no one's ever heard of. Uh, get to know some of the locals. And then after like four days of shooting on the fifth day, you do like a live comedy show that was cobbled together from that experience and kill it every time. Like it's, it's a really cool show. It's one of those things where it really does fulfill everything you'd want it to be in terms of it being a CBC show. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, I, I mean, I got hired on to the pilot actually before Johnny Harris was hired. I think he, he came on a couple of days after me, but there was That's another host attached for to it. 
for those. Yeah, but they, those guys hired me out of the blue, uh, maybe because of my experience in Kenny and Spenny, maybe on the Ron James show, doing streeter stuff with him. Um, the, the guys at Frantic uh, brought me in and hired me basically to help develop the pilot episode, which was based on this obscure Danish format with some dude with a fuzzy mic plugged into a camera. Oh, weird. And at the time, I was really into This American Life and like really not into doing, like I, did not, I wanted to take a jump from the beta cam aesthetic, do something cinematic, heartfelt and funny. And then like, so from a director standpoint, producer at the time, that was my agenda. And then Johnny, I couldn't have been a better choice to do that show because he's just like, he's got that perfect balance as a comic, likable, funny. Yeah, he's charismatic for sure. Yeah, he's amazing. And like, he, I mean, I, the, I think the success of the show is owed like to him now. I mean, he's really like. Well, the format that. I thought was really cool too. It reminded me of um, like the older Seinfeld episodes where they intersplice the, the comedy show from the end is sort of cut through the entire episode, you know? Well, yeah, the live comedy show serves as sort of the narrative backbone. So yes, it really exactly. takes the viewer through the journey and helps them sort of connect with what the experiences are with sort of the humorous sort of backstory or, you know, it's like the inner thought bubble. Yeah, no, it's wicked. So, uh, I, but so it's been an amazing who's... success and I've been super fortunate to have been a part of Do that. Do you know where people like uh, who might be watching this interview that are in the States where they can find it? Uh, you know what? It's on air. <laughs> it's on Air Canada flights. I know that much. <laughs> nice. uh, I think it's on. It might be on Amazon Prime. It kind of like any shows, even like Kenny and Spenny. It's like they'll pop up. There'll be like a, I guess, a license, a licensee. Like, so it'll get licensed for like a, a year or a few months and then disappear again. So it seems to come and go. I mean, you can always, you know, you can always block your. You know, VPN, you yeah. and watch it that way but it's and look if you want to torrent it i'm sure it's fine, there's a lot of like, uh clips on youtube for people who just want to get a feel for it too that's what yeah. i was doing last it's night. a freaking awesome show and it's like an education on the country it's all that shit you never really paid it i don't know how much you paid attention to canadian history and i mean so so but it's all johnny mcdonald like all i remember is johnny mcdonald johnny mcdonald and like you know the americans and like but this is like, it's not just the people now. It's like, there's some really awesome Canadian history that you like. I, I've been all over the country and it's like, it's blown me away. The shit I, I had no idea about. And it's like, I think people who watch it really appreciate that. Like it's an education on, it's a time capsule of this country, but it's also learning about the history. And it's not, it's not cheesy. Like Johnny's very, like, he's not a cheesy comic. He's pretty, he's a pretty sharp guy. And it's like, yeah, he's down to earth. Really well, like it's not the hokey, like, oh, you know, I'm going to, you yeah, know, yeah. Get, dress up as a clown and get dunked in the ice. You know, it's like, it's really like, I think he really does a good job of like, make it feel like contemporary. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. And it's nice because uh, CBC, you know, even myself, I've made jokes that it stands for consistently boring content. Um, but, you know, I think that's not really the case. I think people need to dig a little deeper because there is a lot of quality programming on CBC, but it gets a bad rep for being like, you know, your dad's channel or whatever. Yeah, I know. Well, this hour is 22 minutes. Isn't everyone's cup of tea, but it's Air like... Farce, I remember watching as a kid, too. And yeah. I think that's kind of lame, but, you know. It wasn't really my thing, and but I appreciate who it reaches, and it's like... But I totally agree. CBC, I think, is really diversified, like, its content. And, like, you can watch one thing go, this is shit, I don't want to watch this anymore. But, like, there's a lot of great stuff that, like, you know... You well, know I mean, Kenny versus Spenny started there, right? So... Yeah, <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah, really. Especially yeah. considering how the show ended up by like season six, you know? Oh, yeah. It's it's crazy. It's it's interesting to look back and like, you know, just the improbability of it seems so much more now than ever because you're just like, how did that even happen? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, so the first season was great, here. though. I'm sorry? I was, I was just saying the first season, I, I always loved uh, the original Kenny vs. Spenny, you know, debut season. It had a different feel, but it was it was still great. It was a I cut you off. What were you saying? Sorry. Uh, I don't remember. But yeah, the <laughs> first season, it was like it's it's like baby pictures in a way, or high school pictures. You're kind of like, eh, you know. I think we did some great episodes. I mean, 26 out of all yeah. of those. Some of them, I think, are keepers. Some of them, I mean, look. Yeah, I mean, even up to season six, every episode was an experiment. But it's like season one, like especially, and being CBC and like where we were slotted, it was a real like you know, really towing the line constantly of like, how far can we go and how far should we go? Be, like, we don't want to piss off the broadcasters, but we want to be edgy and um, just kind of experimenting with that, getting the feedback and be like, oh crap. Like, you know, 
I, th- I think with anything I work on, I, I never really want to be thinking about what the expectation is or like what the criticism is going to be because I mean, it's like music, I guess. It's like you just kind of have to just go for it. Yeah. Um, for better or for worse. But I think for better in that, I think when you're trying to fulfill what people's expectations are, it waters down the content. And we're guilty of that. We definitely did that a couple of times. I have no doubt about it. But it's like, I think with CBC, there's a little bit, we are a little maybe more conscientious about that being a new show and like, what is this thing? You know, like who are, who are these guys? Like in this context, this unlikely context, right? Like they are combative, but it's not like they're two like jackass, you know, guys or jock guys. Like neither of them are guys who are going to jump on a skateboard and maybe break a leg. You know yeah. what I mean? Like they're both pretty, pretty safe. So it was really cool. That's what I love about this show amongst many things is how they just kind of tried this thing that was so out of their comfort zone. Yeah, you see that even in, in the first season as well. Yeah, I was watching one. You guys got a lot away with a lot of stuff too, considering like the news came on right after. It was, you know, kids are awake. And, and I'm watching the one last night with um, who can not use their hands for the longest, which I believe was the first season uh, because I recognize the old house. That's how I, I differentiate. But, uh, you know, Kenny at one point says, no wanking, Spenny. And I'm like, you know, kids probably don't get it, but it's still the parents probably like, oh, shit. You just made a masturbation joke at 5 p.m. on CBC. Well, it was, it was interesting. I think even right up through like the last season, you know, edits would go in with some, some of the craziest content. And I think part of it was, you know, we want to get this in here, but part of it is also like, okay, so, I mean, anybody who works in television understands, especially if you're making edgy stuff, is like you have to be strategic and like you put, you put in like, maybe there's like six things in the episode. You're like, they're going to totally ax this stuff. But it's a, it's a, it can be a bit of a negotiation tactic where it's like, okay, we'll get rid of the scene of, you know, whatever, but we want to keep that scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. And what was really interesting is sometimes those scenes that we thought were for sure going to get cut slipped through and got aired. And it's just like, I couldn't, like, couldn't believe it. It's like, it's bizarre. I, I think, I don't want to say people weren't paying attention, but I, I mean, sometimes we're busier than other times and who knows? I, I, I don't know if they fine tooth comb the show every time. Sometimes they'd pick out stuff we didn't even think was controversial and, I, and it really, mm. I don't think it was. And they'd be like, that has to go. I'd be like, yeah, but you, you're still going to let us do that joke. Or like, Kenny can still eat fake shit out of a toilet. Like, holy, <laughs> holy fuck. Like it was crazy. The stuff that would slip by, like it kind of surprised us. Like, you know, man, um, I have so many questions I want to get to. And I, I, feel bad because obviously I can't ask everybody's questions. There was a ton. There was dozens. So um, since we're on the Kenny versus Benny already, I want to shout out to the fan page guys because they've got a great community going there. And Jonathan oh, yeah. Brown. Best fans ever. Yeah, Jonathan Brown runs the page uh, and he reached out to me yesterday. So I just want to give him a shout out. Thank you to everybody for submitting questions. And I'm sorry I can't share them all. Uh, but Sebi's a busy man. So um, first, I, I, Mike Breezy wanted to know, meeting Kenny and Spenny what was the story there obviously you've already mentioned that you and Kenny knew each other since you were kids so where does Spenny come into the equation and and how does everything unfold yeah well you know Kenny's the story with Kenny too it's like I met him because of my dad actually which sounds really bizarre but like Hmm. like when I was a like I I didn't really start getting to know my dad till I was around 12 or so and like I sort of had a pseudo stepbrother named Simon Kenny and Simon were best buddies Kenny would hang out at my dad's play, place with Simon, listening to the, you know, music and smoking weed and stuff, like in their teens, like crazy shit. Um, and then um, I guess like sometime around, like in Kenny's teens, his dad died. Oh shit. Which was really sad. But like after his dad died, his mom was alone in their house and my dad was looking for a place. My dad moved in with Kenny's mom, not romantically, which is oh, weird. really awful visual, but, Um, so my dad lived with Kenny's mom for like 20 years and that was the hub. We'd go and hang out and listen to like Ravi Shankar and craft work and play cards and smoke weed and go to like Lee garden in Chinatown at two in the morning. And it was a bit of a, you know, there was always different people coming and going, but Kenny was always there. He'd bring by crazy movies, always making fun of each other, always riffing and joking. And like, it was just a really great like scene just to hang out in. And like, I guess from that time, like, my dad sort of stepped in as, as a bit of a paternal figure for Kenny. And then Kenny became a bit of a pseudo big brother to me. Like he was always really trying to steer me in the right direction. You know, I was a, I was a bit of a, a little green, you know, and, and being, a, uh, you know, younger than him too. It's like, you know, he was very, 
you know, Kenny's a real natural mentor. Like he loves to like, if you haven't heard of something that he loves, he like, he will put it in your hands. Like, it's like, you haven't tried these pickles, I'm buying them for you. You haven't heard, you know, Eric B and Rakeem, I'm making you an album. Like he was always trying to like, like uh, influence me and stuff like that. Brought me out on shoots when I was younger. And uh, that brings me to meeting Spenny for the first time. So like they were working on this film called It Don't Cost Nothing to Say Good Morning about a homeless alcoholic. Yes, I've seen that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this guy who's like four feet tall named Shorty Gordy used to hang out with Summer Hill. And I came out because Kenny was, he was cool. He was like, hey, come out, like PA, like just watch how it, how it happens, you know? And I'm like in my teens and I was like a bit of a rock and roll guy at the time, leather jacket and stuff. And first time I met Spenny, he takes a look at me and he's like, uh, you know, why are you wearing an iron cross? Because I had an iron cross hearing. Oh, okay. And it, I was wearing it because, like, I was into a band called The Cult at the time. They had an iron oh, yeah. cross. I just thought it was a cool symbol. I didn't really. And, like, you know, Spenny kind of took me to task, you know, about what it meant and, you know, being Jewish and like that. And I, you know, I was like, okay, this guy's a little intense. And it's like, it's just a, an earring. You know what I mean? But, like, <laughs> I guess throughout the years, you know, I'd cross paths with Spenny and he was always very, very aloof and, and stand back. He'd stay, he'd stay in office, I'd say. Um, I was always seen as Kenny's guy and especially like, you know, when we started Kenny and Spenny, like I think outside of the show, he's been super cool with me and really like really decent. But when he's in show mode and his brains in that headspace, I'm, I am the other side mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm Kenny's guy. Once we start shooting, I'm Kenny's guy. Oh, interesting. No, so, but it's, uh, believe me, like I still, I still feel like I'm getting to know Spenny. He's, he's not, uh, keeps his cards close to he's his pretty chest. guarded i was gonna say i mean i've only had limited interaction obviously with him but i i found uh he was very similar to how he is on the show he's kind of guarded um yeah. a little bit neurotic for sure but he, he seems to have a really good heart you know he does he does have a good heart and he's like he's he's creative feeling i mean there's their relationship started in creativity and it's like he's still like you know trying to like do stuff. I mean, whatever it is. And I know Kenny likes to shit on it, but I mean, to his credit, I mean, he's really, yeah, he's always trying something. Yeah. Yeah. And he's from, you know, he's from his world's always been, you know, doing film and television. Like, I mean, it's, you know, Kenny and Spenny aside, it's, that's always been his thing in music now. Right. So. Yeah. He's a true artist. Yeah. 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 Um, Kenny, I, a lot of people were asking me like, Oh, when are you going to get Kenny on your show after I put up the Spenny episode? And I had been trying for as long as I had been trying to get Spenny, probably since like last winter. And he's just been fucking trolling me hard. Like the first time, I think he just said, uh, I'll do his show when it's big or something like that. And then Spenny comes on and I message him again, hoping that'll give me a little more, you know, leverage or whatever. And then he says, I don't go on after Spenny, sorry. And I, I went on, you know, saying, hey man, yeah, the headliner always goes on after the opening act. Try to grease uh -huh. the wheels a bit. And uh, eventually he said, too busy right now, one day. You know, I keep just trying to, I'm a persistent guy. So eventually the most recent interaction, he's tentatively agreed to come in person because he thinks Zoom is stupid or something. And he also wants a limo and a bottle of scotch. So I don't know, man, I'll get that limo and bottle of scotch if it means Kenny comes down to my basement to do this show. So stay persistent. I know, I mean, I know you're you, but like, I, I, I have no doubt Kenny gets hit up daily oh, to like of course. talk to people legit or illegitimate that you know for their podcast or their first episode or whatever so i think his first instinct is to sort of put up the smoke screens and and the, the flash flares or whatever to like sort of tight like weed those people out because like i mean the guy gets inundated all the time so i think he's just it's his way of kind of like weeding out the the weeds so to speak Oh yeah, it's been honestly kind of fun, and and I don't embarrass easily, so I'll keep Adam, you know. But yeah, uh, I'll he see even if I can put in a good word. <laughs> oh, thank you, dude. Uh, he even mentioned like, yeah, I don't, I'm not even a fan of podcasts like Spenny or something like that. He he said that's Spenny's thing or or something along those lines. But we'll see, maybe one day, you know. Yeah. Anyways, back to you though. I've got many more questions here. Um, Brett Keeling wants to know. Well, and I was wondering this as well. Uh, what episode was most difficult for the crew? Were there any times where you guys almost quit? Obviously, the fart one seems like a pretty bad one. But uh, yeah, was there any episode that was just brutal? Well, I mean, yeah, the fart one was... It was fun, though, because it was just like once we did the F-A-R-T with Kenny, it was just like the best. Like that, yeah. that was actually a lot of fun. The stare fart. Um, but yeah, hardest comps. It's a good question. Um, 
Like from I don't know. Like, look, we did 88 yeah. episodes. They weren't all to my taste. There was a few of just like, this is so not my thing, but it's like maybe I, I get surprised sometimes. We'll work on something that's not at all my thing, and it winds up being kind of good, and it's like, you know. But um, 10 Mile Race was – I think with the whole Safi thing dying, I, it wasn't me, but like a couple of crew members when Spenny was going into the cemetery, (laughs) uh, the fake funeral, a couple of the crew members, like, I'm not doing this. This is not, I refuse to do this. Like that was one of the, it was shocking because it's like hearing that because it's like, it's like, okay, that's is interesting because it's like, we're actually at an impasse here. We're like, it's too much for those guys. Cause morally they just felt it was like, this is just not right. Um, well, that's interesting. I, I had another question that directly relates to that. Um, they were asking, uh, was there a time that it was like hard for you guys not to intervene? And that was one of the examples, but also the AIDS thing where Spenny thinks he has AIDS. Like, was it hard for you guys as a friend to not just be like, oh, I want to tell him it's not real? You know, not really. I think it's, it's one of those, that was a game, one of those things where it's just like, this is so not my thing. I would like, I, to me, it's, like doing the show, you kind of want to just go with it. And like, maybe in the edit, it's like, it doesn't work or whatever. Like you can't, you can't create something always thinking, how is this, this is not going to work. Like, you know what I mean? But yeah. I mean, things like that, it's like, I was just so not into it. I just thought it was in bad taste for a lot of reasons, cool. but <laughs> also trusting, you know what, it's that, you know, what am I going to do? It's like, that's just the way it is. You're not going to step in. You can say it's not a great idea, but then it happens and you're just like, okay, I'm just going to let this play out. And, you know, maybe, maybe it'll backfire. Maybe it'll be, you know, there'll be some, maybe we'll work out to be something funny. I don't know. But like, I think stuff like that was okay. It's like, I don't know, like episodes, like, <clears throat> I mean, a crew intervening moment, one of my favorite, funniest moments that I told Kenny about years later. It's like, holy shit, why didn't we use that in the episode? And I know why, because it was the You Can Get Drunk, uh, You Can Drink More Beer episode. It's one of the best. And uh, so Spenny is hammered, uh, obviously, but like he basically trashes like the first floor. I know that part was used in the episode and he fucking, he punches this um, picture of Gordy from that movie you're talking about and cuts his hand and the other camera guy a buddy of mine andrew the guy used to be a bouncer and he sees spenny doing his thing and he puts his camera down and he grabs spenny in a full nelson to restrain him because he's like he's trying to protect him from hurting himself yeah really and so i pick up his camera and i'm literally like holding them like that like filming kenny and andrew holding spenny in a full nelson this is fucking amazing like i like to me, it's like film everything. Never, I think a lot of camera ops might instinctively put a camera down in a lot of the situations you're in. For me, it was like in those moments, that's when you got to make sure you're filming. You can sort it out later. You may feel in the moment it's uh, off color. Maybe someone's going to get beat up. I don't know. But it's like if you don't film it, it doesn't exist. It's not my place to make those choices in the moment. I got to film everything. Um, anyway, so he does that and there's this moment where it's like what the fuck are you doing man like you can't you can't interfere like and kenny got fucked he was livid he was just like dude like this is you cannot break the fourth wall like that like you can't step in and interfere at all um and he was so mad like we never used the footage but now it sounds hilarious it's like this it was literal literal chaos with like literally the camera guy jumping in like getting spenny up and it full nelson i thought it was amazing it was so funny but it was also like dude like you can't you can't do that like that is such a no-no um yeah, yeah. i'm sure and everyone then, would love to see that footage though <laughs> oh god i know i'd somewhere i would love to see that again there's also like i mean the keeping poop in their pants i mean that was obviously really smelly and like um uh, what else is there i don't know the, the porno episode. I mean, I we had fun doing those crazy videos with Kenny, but I know the other team with Spenny, like making an actual porno. It's funny because that season, there was a different camera guy. He was sort of fancied the porn as much as Spenny did. Um, <laughs> great guy, old friend from Ryerson. Um, and I remember afterwards, he was just like, this is, is disgusting. Like he was so, I don't think he was necessarily looking forward to doing it, but afterwards, I just remember being like, just almost traumatized like it was just like putting a camera up close to that it's like he was just like okay <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to do that again. yeah 
And I think that was kind of like, it was one of those moments where the crew is probably, I wasn't there, but the crew is probably looking at each other like, this is like fucked up. Like, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Um, someone, uh, who was it? Tyler Morgan wanted to know, because by the end of the series, it seemed like Kenny and Spenny's relationship was very strained. Uh, and he wanted to know if there was like a specific moment or episode that sort of marked the beginning of that decline. Well, most creative relationships end on like a sour note. And I, I would, I mean, I would almost say that their this show almost like season one almost started on that in terms of like, it started right when their working relationship might've been on the outs, which is funny because it's like, you know, usually in any creative like partnership, you're trying to create great stuff and it's all supposed to be positive. But like the show, as you know, is all about contention and rivalry. And yeah. it's like, I think those guys already had that a bit with, you know, doing the film pitch and just in their creative working re relationship. But it's like, I think the show actualized that. I mean, the mask became the face for lack of a better yeah, yeah. expression. And that like, I think differentiating those two things became harder and harder, even off camera. And like, it's funny cause they would be arguing like crazy sometimes like about nothing to do with the episode. Like literally like there'd be a fight about, maybe an edit that Spenny saw, whatever. And I'd be always filming. I'd always be like, this is, and I'd always joke like, hey, this is, this is the show, guys. This is what we should be filming. Just to try and like levitate the mood. Cause like they argued and fought a lot about creative differences, especially like leading up to season. I think there's a lot of like, I remember one time they had an argument over who knew story arc better. And it went on for like 45 minutes and it was hilarious. It was, I thought it was one of the funniest things I ever heard, but um, I think for a lot of the crew, because I've known those guys for so long, I, I'm kind of like that guy in the far side cartoon who's got the wheelbarrow in hell and those devils are going, <laughs> yeah. not reaching that guy. Cause like that stuff would just like, br like blow over me. Whereas I remember a lot of the crew would find it really like toxic and confusing and kind of like even the production office, like confused and stuff. I mean, when you, if you listen to that exclaim interview they just did like a few weeks ago i mean yeah, sometimes yeah. it was like that it was literally like just chaotic talking over each other well they're like an old married couple almost you know what i mean they've got that uh you feel almost tense around them i could imagine when they're having one of these bouts oh yeah and we're like hey we just want to have fun you know it's like we're doing a show let's have fun and that's like you know but that 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 contention obviously is like part of the, the secret magic formula yeah, what that's the goal yeah so great and like going back to tyler's question it's like i think maybe one of the major cracks started to form is just when they started to pursue their own projects away from each other. It's like, mm. you know, I'm, I'm doing a solo album type of thing. And it's like, Oh, you're doing a solo album. Well, I'm fuck you. I'm going to do my solo album. And it's like, I think, you know, Kenny did testes and then Spenny was uh, revving to do single weight Spenny. And I think that was kind of the nail in the coffin in a way. Cause it's kind of like, okay, you're, you're now moving on right to whatever the next thing is. And it's not, doesn't involve me. So I think, you know, as much as I think now they're, you know, they encourage each other doing whatever they want to do at the time, it felt like a, a slight, right? So Yeah, no, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens with bands a lot of time too. Somebody goes to make a solo album and then they just break up because they feel like betrayed or whatever, or the unity is gone, you know? Oh, totally. Not realizing that that formula is really the best shit they'll ever do. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but mean, you can't like, overthink it. It's got to be all natural. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that actually uh, leads into a cool question. This is more of a technical one by Benjamin Jones. He wanted to, I got the, the vibe from this guy that he's into film and stuff as well. And uh, he wanted to know what was the average turnaround time to shoot and edit a full season on average? Well, uh, I don't know. There'd be like three, maybe three editors all kind of like leapfrogging each other. Like each one would cut maybe four episodes. And like we had the best editors ever, like Duncan, Christy, Marco Porcia, and, and uh, Samir was amazing. Like really editors that I think also had a lot of strength in, in terms of even just being directors, like really got like, they weren't just like, you know, you know, marionettes or whatever. Like they, they would turn like shit into gold. And like, we've, you know, Kenny will say the same thing, but they were like Rumpelstiltskin. Like they had such a, an amazing way of taking like, you know, some of his 20, 30 hours of footage and finding the story. Right. I mean, like we, we would have the narrative arc of like, you know, the chronology of what we were shooting, but sometimes they'd big stuff up and like, you know, the music and just, you know, there is a real sleight of hand in editing. And it's like, 
these guys would like whip around like a rough cut in like two weeks. I mean, if that's oh. what you're dedicated to and that's like what you're doing, it's like they would have a rough cut in two weeks. Sometimes like it'd be fat, like 40 minutes long, you know, because they weren't sure, like, do you want these scenes or not? And sometimes it'd be like tight, like 24, 26 minutes, you know, have to cut like four minutes out of them. It's like, which was always hard, man. It's always, I understand you got, you can't release like these epic long episodes. Now it'd be interesting to see them, but at, you know, at the time it's like, you can't, it's funny, like, once you watch a 30-minute cut of Kenny and Spenny, like, it's just, like, like a Christmas special, like, the pacing and everything else, it really changes things up. And I don't think for the better. Like, I think you come, you want to go in, Short and strike, sweet. and you yeah. get That's awesome. Oh, that actually kind of leads me, I had my own question uh, about, I saw you were a head writer, uh, and, you know, you've been there since the beginning. But what exactly does a head writer mean for a show that, you know, I mean, a lot of people try to accuse it of being scripted, but I feel like it seems pretty real when you watch it. So like, you know, what, what does writing an episode entail? Well, you have writers and documentaries. And like, I think I just answered this question recently to some fans online, but like you can't go to a broadcaster and get X amount of money and they just go, well, just let us know when you're done guys. Yeah. Like they want to know how you're going to spend their money. And it's like you, like, what we would have to do is basically say, this is what our intention is. These like, what are we going to shoot? What are the competitions going to be? What are the humiliations going to be and get approval? Like you can't just go, um, you know, you can't just say, well, here you go. Here's an episode. And then basically they go, well, we're not going to air that. So you have to pay the 500,000 that it just cost us. Like, so my job was always um, before seasons, like literally helping to cobble together the bullet list of like, this is, these are the places we're going to go. These are the people we're going to see, you know, coming up with t-shirt ideas for Kenny. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'd always have lines in my, like a lot of it was also just from in the field where it's like, you know, we're there with the camera and Kenny's in his room. We're like, well, fuck, let's shoot something. It's like, all right, well, let's put a diaper in their head and jump on the bed. And here's a funny <laughs> song I remember from my childhood or, you know, or coming up with competition ideas, like who can eat more meat was like, to me like my that was my baby you know what i mean i used to work nice. in a meat shop as a teenager and like a lot of those beats like meat smoothie like coming up with like so production's got to like get this shit for us too right so like you go into a week of shooting and it's like well who do you need where do you want to go you know what do you need so it's like all right we need a you know maurice del taco is going to need a mustache we were going to go to this park so we might need a permit to shoot there although a lot of the times we shot without permits we're going to need a uh you know um a six foot six guy to like, you know, wearing a leather outfit, you know, like we, you have to go into these things with some kind of plan or, you know, like a you're not going to get a show. Or, yeah. But that said, like, I know it drove them crazy or production office, but like we'd start a week off and like, it'd usually be Kenny. You'd be like, you'd be like, no, don't need it. Don't need it. It'd be all these props. The PA would get like, you know, sex toys or some crazy props or whatever. And Kenny would be like, return them. Don't need them all the time. Get the money back. It's a waste of money. Um, and then it was always best idea wins. It was just making sure we had stuff in our back pocket. Like I was saying with a documentary, you go, you're going to shoot a documentary about birds. It's like, you have to tell whoever's paying the money, where are you going to go? What your plan is? And yeah. do you have some kind of like outcome? Like we're going to take it, we're going to wind up in Niagara Falls or like, we're going to wind up whatever. And most of that shit got thrown out the window, but it was just really going in with a bit of a, a map and then throwing the map away. Oh, cool. That's, so nice that's kind of it. like, it's loose, but it's like, it's funny. Cause I remember, I remember one time I, you know, get, all, get a little mad at Kenny. Cause like, oh, dude, you're, you, you know, you're using that line. Like it's your line. Like what some rude shit. Like I, you know, somebody I'd throw him off camera and he was like, dude, like, you know, writers on like, you know, Jimmy Kimmel or Conan, like, you know, that's just the job. Like you, you, you come up with a zinger and it goes out there and it becomes there or whatever. And it's just, that just comes with the job. It's like, yeah, okay, I get it. But it, it made me really wary work with comics afterwards. I mean, Kenny's the only guy that gets the, the Sebi shit. So I just stick to stupid puns and whispering rude jokes to the crew to make them laugh. But it's like, I, I, uh, it was a learning experience for me. And in the end, look, like I, I always thought like when I was younger, I wanted to do acting shit, but I, I, I suck on camera. And it's like being able to like vicariously like go places with Kenny has been like the best. And it's like, he, I mean, Look, I, I've given him tons of shit, but he definitely doesn't need me. I mean, him him on his own in the sink or swim situation is like the, the most entertaining shit I, I've ever seen. Like, it's always, always funny, always great. The more uncomfortable he is, the funnier he is. And I know he hates feeling uncomfortable, but like if he's in that place, those are some of the best moments in the show, so... 
That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I, what's her name? Sorry, I got to look this one. Georgina McIver. Uh, she wanted to know, I asked Spenny this as well, but I'd like to know from a cruise perspective, um, which challenges you guys wished would have happened that never came into fruition? Well, like when we did the Christmas special, the original comp was going to be who can stay crucified the longest. Oh my God. And we were going to have two crosses put up. I can see why that didn't make it. But then they were like, the broadcaster was like, there's no way. Yeah. And then someone was like, well, Jesus got technically crucified on Easter, not on Christmas. So, you know, and then I think because of that, <laughs> that historical fact, it killed it for the guys or Kenny especially, but I thought that's it'd funny. be a lot funnier. That's funny that that's what killed it for him. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, there's, we, uh, I mean, you never know. We might do another season. There's tons of great comp ideas. I wouldn't want to burn them, but like, you know, there's some unshootable ones. Like I always want to do like a seven deadly sins or like 12 stations oh, cool. of the cross. And like the UK, uh, Ed versus Spencer episode, they did an episode, uh, who can get sicker, which I'm not I sure you guys want to do anymore, but I figure it's out there. It's like, they did some funny stuff actually. And like, um, but there's episodes like it velocities between like, you know, straight up comps. Then there's like, okay, like I know Kenny is going into a season, like, what's the create, like crazy titles, people like basically clickbait, like you're going to want to watch this type of titles, you know, who can kill more or whatever. That's true. Um, versus like, you know, I know we said this before, like who can knit a sweater and it's like, sometimes the most simple, boring comps have been some of the best especially I find like when Kenny's out of his comfort zone, you know, it's like, so there's been, but there's been some crazy comp ideas, like who can lure, you know, more kids into a van type of thing. It's like, <laughs> come on, man. like, like I know that people are going to go like, I want to watch this and be offended or whatever. And it's like, but I mean, to me, I, I mean, it's not my, my thing, <laughs> That's pretty dark. It's done, but it's like, come on. It's like unshootable. Like, yeah, but like I, what I do love about Kenny, and I know your experiences right now trying to get him on your show, is he will say no, 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 no until the the, the cream gets to the top. You know what I mean? And it can be frustrating as hell because sometimes you're like, dude, like let's just do this comp. It's amazing. And when you look back at our our our, our episodes we've done, I mean, there's some of there in there that I know I'm surprised we even did. Like I even with Kenny's point of view and what I I believe he thinks, I'm surprised he's okay to do them. Like. Even he, I think, would look at some of the titles that we didn't go like, that's like, what was I thinking? You know what I mean? Yeah. But whatever. It is what it is. And we should just be proud of it. So I know when I asked Spenny, he said that he had always wanted to do a, a better golfer episode. Yeah, that's a little boring. <laughs> yeah. That's really boring. <laughs> I mean, but that's the thing, you know, it's like, what, you know, what's the comp? Is it them? Is it 20, 20 minutes of them on, a, on, on the green trying to golf? Or is it like all the lead up to it? You know what I mean? And like, that's the thing. There could be a very lame sounding comp like that, that the lead up can be a really fun journey, especially if like, you know, we can come up with some crazy shit for Kenny to do. That's actually entertaining. Well, that's, that's the maybe thing. It's nothing to do with golf, right? A lot of the time it'd be really boring, maybe premise, but then Kenny comes in with some crazy way to cheat. And all of a sudden it's, you know, got this level of interest peeking through the roof because Kenny's doing this bizarre, crazy shenanigans, you know? Oh yeah, totally. It's uh but, you know, I've been proven wrong many times. I mean, it, we're, we all have our opinions of what's great and what's not. And I know Kenny, Spenny as well, they've probably gone into some comps where they thought it was going to suck and it wound up being really great and vice versa. Like yeah. some comps where we thought we were like shoe in like amazing that I want to fall, you know, just being flat. Cause maybe the, you know, that week the vibe wasn't right. The, you know, or maybe we didn't plan it enough. Maybe we, we, you know, just didn't come up with enough shit on the, on the day and just kind of, you know, it happens with any creative process, right? Like, and especially the nature of that show being a lot of it's on the spot, ad lib, improv, you know, so I could see how that could not work out sometimes if people, like you said, are just not in the right headspace or whatever, yeah. you know? I mean, we did a lot of stuff, you know, going back to uncomfortable moments, like, you know, where I think productions, uh, you know, a production is insured. You have to prove to the insurers the show's not going to get sued. We really, like, flirted with that a lot but i think production standpoint and they were amazing for this would basically be you can't do x and then turn their back <laughs> knowing full well x was going to happen but at it's least they protect the production company from any liability yeah and then you know did, was it real did he really did they really smoke weed did they 
Um, you know, oh, yeah, there's like, no way well, to prove it necessarily. Weed. Sorry? There's no way to prove it you're saying necessarily because it's just on camera, right? It could have been fake weed or... Exactly. And it's like, you know, I love that. I mean, I've never worked in any show like this, not even remotely, where we did things that most shows you just automatically be like, oh, there's no way. You know, and it really... It's, to me, it's it's made me into an improviser in terms of like solutions on the fly. You know what I mean? And I think I'm, I'm naturally that kind of person anyways, but in terms of like my professional career, like it's been my forte and definitely cut my teeth doing that on KBS. It's like, it really, I mean, because it can't be particularly, it was really that idea of like, you know, there's always a way, there's always a solution to do shit. You know, like, can we get uh, three, can we afford to get three actors to come in uh, and be Leatherman and, and to attack Spenny, uh, you know, chase him. Uh, actors, it's going to cost, you know, Actra, maybe a thousand a person. It's three grand right there. That's half our Actra budget. That's the Actors Union. But then, you know, oh, yeah. we had these amazing women in our production office that were like looking at the back of Now magazine, finding a leather, like a real Leatherman, calling him up and saying, hey, do you want to make 150 bucks for an hour? Or That's two? what I was just going to say. Yeah, go non union. Yeah, or like, you know, the funeral, same thing. It's like, get a, you know, are we going to get production? was always very thinking, uh, you know, off the bat, like, how are we going to do this logistically and legally? And then, you know, Kenny would be like, you know, don't pay anything. Like, it shouldn't cost us any money, which I know drove him crazy sometimes because he was always asking for the impossible. But that always pushed us, always pushed people like, you know, in the, in the, in the crew, in the production office to like find stuff. And I know it drove them crazy. I mean, there was a lot of times where, they would come to me and be like, you know, what, what is it, what is really happening? Like, is he going to cancel this? Is it going to happen? And it's like, I always tried my best to mediate without crossing any lines, especially with Kenny, but it's like, I know, uh, you know, it, it was always a, it was an interesting experience, I think, to be able to make television in such a sort of lawless way that, uh, yeah, it's very guerrilla style. Oh, so guerrilla and amazing. Like just an impossible, impossible circumstances. Like we, like you could never do that in any other show. It's just impossible. Like I, I know Kenny says all the time, but can we, could we ever make this today? I don't know. I mean, we, we could, but it wouldn't be the same. It just wouldn't be the same. And it's another thing. Let me just digress a little bit. So 288 Sherburn, where we shot the last like five seasons, here's another story for you. We, uh, we, uh, I think after season, I can't remember what episode it was, where Kenny attacked the house with a machete. And like, I think the, maybe it was an octopus season. There was a smell of the octopus. After the octopus episode, there was a smell in the house. We, we called the octopus ghost. That, uh, and we rent the house out. And I think production, they didn't do anything to fix the house up. We left, the machete marks on the walls. It stank like dead octopus. And then the next season comes in. We approached them again. Ryerson students have been living in all year. The landlady was like, there's no way I'm renting to you. Also, she wised up the fact we're making a TV show there, like more like a successful one. And she raised the rent, like I think it was like five grand a month or whatever it was. Like it oh, went up geez. from like 2,000 to 5,000. And so the production was like, well, let's find somewhere else. Fuck that. You know, Kenny especially is like, screw that. We'll find another big house. And we quickly realized there's nowhere else in Toronto that we could think of that we could find a house that size where you could do the crazy shit that we do. You know what I mean? So it was like- yeah. You can't set fire to shit in the backyard in Rosedale. You can't run out the front door naked without someone calling the cops in like, you know, Lee side. It's like, it was like, we got to make this work. This is like a, a unique location. Like there's really nowhere else in the city. We could have shot the show, but it's Sherbert and Girard. Wow. Yeah. I, I visited there once and I've heard that now it's, it's even more of kind of like a ghetto area. It That's hasn't really yeah, changed at all. It's weird. And it's funny because I used to live next to that house when I went to Ryerson I lived at 286 uh, Sherbrooke no before KVS. Like I had a couple of roommates. That's so weird. Yeah. And then like, you know, a couple of years later, I'm back right there. So I know the neighborhood, man. I, I used to have like, instead of like flamingos in the front yard, it was like prostitutes and junkies. Shit. It was very, very sketchy, but perfect. Too. Um, well, you kind of touched on this. Um, I'm going to butcher this guy's name. I think it's Veer Yuroshalmi. I, maybe I did it right, actually. Um, he wants to know, how can fans help get a season seven? And I actually saw somebody posting uh, on the subreddit that they had contacted the CBC, and this was the CBC's response, saying, hi there, thank you for contacting the CBC and your interest in Kenny versus Spenny. 
I have put in a formal request to add more Kenny versus Spenny episodes. They seem to be very popular and for good reason. While I cannot provide any guarantees or timelines at this juncture, you can rest assured that our team will be looking into adding more episodes. So that sounds promising. And I think everyone's kind of wondering, um, you know, they're still alive. They could still do it. Maybe a movie even. Um, but what can we do to help as fans? Or, or do you think that they even want to make a season seven, Kenny and Spenny themselves? Uh, I think now, I think they'd be up for it. I, I, I mean, after we finished the Christmas special, I mean, yeah, they needed some time apart. I think in the live show shows they've been doing, they've sort of rediscovered an appreciation for each other. And, you know, uh, well, absence and I think makes the heart grow fonder and all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But also just like, you know, there's been some, some distance to have perspective on the success of the show and, I mean, it's, it doesn't take long, I think, for them to revert to their dynamic, which is still there in spades. But it's like, I think in terms of like being open to that, it's definitely, it's definitely there. I think it's also like how much work do they want to put into it? Because I, I think there's, there, there have been times over the years, you know, I've talked to Kenny and he's like, he says, you know, there's some plan or whatever, but it's like, I don't think he wants to, they don't want to beg and it's not because of pride or anything. It's like, how badly do they really want to do it? You know what I mean? It's like, they, they, they touch the mountaintop, so to speak. And I think at this point, it's like, if someone came to them and said, we want, we want this and here's some money to do it, we would gladly do it. Absolutely. I think they would, they'd be happy to do it. I think they've had enough time apart now and, and experienced the foibles of trying to do stuff in Canadian television, which is so, so hard. It's hard. You can have a lot of success and, and, not be able to get a show made. I mean, there's really so few places to get a show made here that it's like, I think they've grown. I really appreciate the fact that if you have an opportunity, you can, it's worth it. Um, but yeah, I'm surprised. I mean, I'm that, surprised the, sorry. I was just gonna say, I'm surprised that like Netflix or somebody hasn't come along and said like, Hey, there's clearly interest here. You know, the, uh, the Facebook page they have has like 300,000 likes or, or followers rather. Um, I don't know. It just seems very evident that there's a huge fan base that would support it. So I'm surprised there, you know, it's, haven't been. I'm surprised too. Maybe, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to figure out why. I mean, I know with the fan support, uh, there is an attempt by uh, Jamie Tierney. Great dude. I uh, was on KBS to do that sort of document through live show and he did a crowdfund thing. And I'm, I know people said, well, it was an obscure platform to get the money and whatever. And, but not a lot of people, enough people stepped up to support that. And it's like, you know, Kenny will be like, our fans don't want to pay for it and whatever. And like, not, not in a bad way. He thinks it's kind of cool, but I think uh, I definitely know the audience is there. And I think it'd be really interesting to see, like, we've got a lot of great comp ideas. I think it'd be really interesting to see them, you know, navigate uh, those comps in today's age. And I, I wouldn't want them to like edit themselves I think, I think they've both changed a bit, but I think they're, I mean, they would go right back into it. I think yeah. the second we were into it, and I think we can make some great shit still. Absolutely. I think and a I think, Kickstarter I mean, can, or something. Say that, say it again. A uh, Kickstarter or something. seems like you, it would go off yeah. without a hitch. Again, it's a lot of effort and it's, well, it's not, and it is, but it's like, I think it's also like how badly I think in Kenny's mind, I mean, look, 88 episodes and some of those things, like they sucked. It's like, you know, I think in, in Kenny's mind, it's like, how badly do I want to do that again? And how badly there's still a little bit of like, okay, I'm going to have to contend with the other guy off camera and as a creative partner. And it's like, you know, and they're that much older now too. That's the one thing I could not believe when I uh, did my research on Spenny was I thought they were way younger when the show was on. I always thought they were in their thirties, but they were actually in their forties the whole time. So yeah, yeah I can't imagine some of the comps now when, when Spenny's pushing 60, <laughs> probably just be harder on you as uh, physically speaking you know but kenny's always said you know like this there could be some hilarity of these guys these middle-aged guys trying to do this stupid shit and like that's another thing it's like we would pick episodes that were inspiring to at least one of them probably kenny but it's like you know it's not like we would be i mean we've done we would never do what we've done already like it, yeah there would be no more diaper with a shit in it you know what i mean like but there's some great stuff for us to explore. I think, you know, I'd love to see it happen. And as far as like fan support, I mean, just, you know, yeah. Liking the YouTube pages, watching the the special we just did. I mean, doesn't hurt. I mean, the numbers in Canada are so low. I think someone once said to me that, you know, a highly rated show in Canada is equivalent to the viewership in Chicago. Like, 
oh, you know, wow. a show with like half a million viewers is considered successful or a million viewers, whereas you get canceled with 6 million viewers in like the U S. So it's like, you know, you hear that you Yankees, we need you more than, yeah. <laughs> more but than anyone. I always say like, you know, you look at the shows that are out there and it's like, why, why not KBS? I mean, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but there's a lot of crap as well. And it's like, definitely stuff that I don't think is as good as KBS and why not? Like, why not? Like it'd be, you know, it'd be a fun revival. Trailer Park Boys have done it. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, he, and even if it's just a one-off, I was going to say, when I hear you mention 88 episodes, it seems like one more season, 12 episodes, get to that hundred. It'd be perfect way to do right? it. You know? That's a nice number. Yeah. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. I mean, it's, it really comes down to somebody writing a number on a piece of paper and sliding it across the desk and, Fair enough. Know, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. It's like, we're, we're ready. We're locked and loaded. If someone says, all right, we want to do a season. What do you got? I mean, there's no shortage of ideas. You know, it's not like we're going to be scrambling to figure it out. There's a lot of great ideas. Like I would That's love encouraging. to encouraging, encouraging to hear that. Um, I had a, someone commented, I thought it was a really kind of a cool idea, a bit of a twist. If they didn't want to do just another season was more of a Kenny versus Spenny presents and have other people each week, competing in competitions with Kenny and Spenny filling more of like a judge role. Maybe they give out the humiliation at the end or something like that. I thought it was kind of a neat, maybe it'd be different, but. I think maybe it's like, a, I mean, look, if you're in the U S there'd probably be a lot of spinoff shows. And I, as you know, there's been formats made of the KBS thing. I mean, maybe it's like a game show, like reformat, like a different show. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But still maybe. let their personality shine through, you know? I mean, game shows are a hot thing. I, I don't know, man. It's like, I think the, the edginess of um, Canadian television in terms of like approving shows that are edgy is pretty low. Like it's very safe. It's very like, well, what are people in rural Saskatchewan going to think? And yeah. Or what are, you know, I don't think we've ever really, I think the children's uh, television market is, is totally tapped into, but as far as like, you know, there's always this thing of like, how can we appeal to like teenagers and guys in their early twenties sometimes? And it's like, well, this is a bit of a no brainer. But uh, there seems to be a lack of like wanting to make anything edgy or, or, or pissing anyone off or making the wrong decision. Like no one wants to say yes. It's easier to say no. It's easier to play it safe, you know. So it's just going to really hopefully uh, going to be a fan of the show who is now in a position like Zach at CBC, for example, doing the pandemic thing. He, he was like, yeah, this is like I love this and I want to see more. You know, it's going to take an executive here at least who – you know, is now in a position that was a fan of the show that wants to see it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's possibilities there. I think we've inspired a lot of people that work in television. You know, um, one of those people can help us out. You just mentioned Paldemic. So I feel like I should ask you what that was like for you after all these years coming back and working with the guys in, in an official capacity for Kenny versus Spenny again. I mean, I know it wasn't the same as the old show, but it was still the same spirit, so to speak. Uh, it was fun. I mean, it was a... Look, we got greenlit to do that just a few weeks before we shot it. So it was like, okay, let's just like throw some spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. And it was, it was fun to do. I loved it. Like I love, I mean, I don't shoot outside of KBS, but it's like just holding a camera and with Kenny on the other side of it and Spenny as well. It's like, to me, it's the best. Like I feel like I'm in the front row seat of a private uh, show. Like it's like, I mean, those guys are, are, are who they are. Like they, they click into that even before the cameras start rolling. And it's like, to me, one of the most entertaining things to play out, like seeing their dynamic play out is like the funnest thing. And it's like, I know it was good. I mean, I, I see Kenny all the time anyways. I see Spenny's spirits like sporadically, like if they do a show, a live show, I might, might go and check it out and see him. But um, Kenny, Wait, I, I mean, he's in Kingston, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I see Kenny often and like we're we're buddies, you know, so it nice. wasn't a big step, but it was exciting. It's like, yeah, man, we're doing something again. Like, how cool is this? This is awesome. And it's like, we did it like right when like things were like spiking the first wave. It was the first, like the only production being shot in like Canada, maybe. So, and it was kind of nerve wracking. It's like, well, fuck, like, is this, how bad is this? Are we all going to come out of this with COVID and like, yeah there's a lot of safety stuff we're supposed so like to march april like right when shit was hitting the fan yeah but it was cool to kind of be sort of renegades and do something like you know no one else is doing it and uh you know 
we had a lot of ideas and like what, what we did was kind of just on the fly. I mean, you know, I wanted to see the guys get COVID tests and, you know, but we didn't. So yeah, it's funny because <laughs> in, in pandemic, uh, Spenny was, you know, super paranoid about, uh, getting it. Obviously he was covered up with the six foot pole and all that, which was hilarious. Um, but I had him here in August when we were kind of in, things had like loosened up and we were allowed, you know, he was doing shows again and it was getting a little bit better at the time. Uh, and I've gotten shit in the comment section because I was vaping even, and, and some people make fun of the plexiglass and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, my response to that is I didn't feel stressed about vaping around Spenny. Cause when I picked him up in my car, he didn't even opt to wear a mask. So I was like, I guess he's over this or, or, you know, so when I saw Paldemic, I was like, Oh, something must've changed there from being super paranoid to meh. He had kind of yeah. an attitude about it, you know? I think uh, like everybody, you know, that's like, a, you know, pandemic f- fatigue. Yeah. Right? You just give up kind of like, I mean, you kind of real. I, when we first did the special, it was like, there's so, I mean, there's still so much unknown, but at that time it's like, what the fuck is this? Like, can you get yeah, you it? Die you tomorrow. Get, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to like, if you get it, are you going to get screwed up in like 20 years from now because of it? And that may be a, a thing still, like who knows, but at the yeah, time true. it was just like, it was crazy. Like it was, it was really kind of like, I mean, I'll admit I, when we went into it, I was like, this is like fucked up. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like I, it's a little nerve wracking being around people the first time after like however long, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. just with all the, the media and like the lockdown stuff and everything. So it was tense. Well, you guys were effectively too. going against best medical, you know, practices at the time, what we thought, you know, you probably shouldn't have been filming under those conditions, but thank God you did. Cause that was yeah. pretty funny special. Um, oh, thanks. I'll ask you a couple more questions here. I think uh, I've got two more from the list that I wrote down. One is uh, David Doran wanted to know if any of the crew kept any of the props or things from the show, which I thought was a fun question. Well, it's funny, like in the show, there's a lot of my shit as used as props, like the fencing swords, the yarp yarp mask I made. Oh, yeah. Like, I was like in grade 11 drama class and we had to make masks and people came with like pie plates and stuff. And I, I took this old basketball and made the yarp yarp mask. And then we did wrestler. Uh, I can't remember. I brought it in that season. Like I always, I had all this shit. I was just wanted to get rid of or I didn't really care about. And just, it was just a prop in the house. And then Kenny put it on and then did the rest with a hammer and the underwear is amazing. But like, that disappeared, unfortunately. I don't know where the hell that went. I have like, um, I have like the baby head from like, who's a better parent? Kenny signed the back of it for me. <laughs> I have some t-shirts that were made for some seasons. And you, did you get your Yarp Yarp back? No, man. The, no. So like after a season was done, the house would get cleared out by, I don't know who, someone at the production company or some people thrown in a locker somewhere. And then if there was another season, the couch would come out, the whatever. Some of it would go back to Kenny's house. He had a lot of stuff there too. Um, and then after uh, the last episode, maybe even before the Christmas special, like I heard like the, it got lost. Like basically all the props got lost. They might've been, oh, that sucks. maybe payments were made. Maybe they went up in storage wars. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Yeah, maybe It's too just... bad. Cause like some of that stuff was mine and some of it was Kenny's and, you know, we kind of wanted to bring some of it out for, you know, look, if we ever did another season, it's like, you know, be cool to get that, you know, and some of it was rented too. Like the shark, the, the hammerhead shark was brought in from a rental house. Um, well, eh. hopefully the stuff that you guys lost turns up eventually. It'd be cool if somebody's got it somewhere. Yeah. I think so, a fan once there was like a live event. I can't remember made a yard yard mask to give to Kenny and it was amazing. And, and another fan made a, a, this painting of VRP art that he has in his, he used to have in his Airbnb. Uh, it's like amazing. Like it's pretty, like it's incredible. Some of the shit that's come out of like some of the fans have made some really cool fan art. And props. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Um, okay. Well the last from the fan questions here I've got is uh, a couple of people, Alex Baker and Ryan Stewart were both asking about Donna and whether or not Spenny, tried to follow up and fix things with that girl who helped him out. And then he thought was a mole because Kenny convinced him that, you know, to go with his paranoid vibe. Um, did, was there any like recourse from that afterwards? Did Spenny try to like get back in touch with her? Or? You know, what's funny is like, I see it online all the time. The fans know, like they remember more than I do. Like I, 
<clears throat> I, I, I hate to admit it, but I haven't watched like most of the shows since they aired. Like I really haven't. So it's like, someone's like, oh yeah, Donna. Like, oh yeah, right, right. Yeah, I didn't remember that her name was Donna either, to be fair. Yeah, and even the process of making some of them, like I, I'm gonna have to watch them again. I can't wait to, I wanna watch like some of them again, just remember what the hell we did. Cause it's like, oh yeah, right. That's that happened or whatever. Cause you know, uh, with Donna, I, I mean, that was season one, I think. I don't even know. I can't remember, honestly. And I wasn't even there. Like I, I was, uh, I was with Kenny at the time doing stuff with him. So I have no idea what happened with that, to be honest. I really don't. And I know it's a shitty answer. But no, that's okay. It was I just such a bummer. I think that's why it stuck. <laughs> it stuck with people because it was like this win, little win for Spenny. And it was like, oh, he's, he's hitting it off. She really likes him, genuinely digs him. And then he fucks it up like royally, you know? Yeah, that was pretty funny. It's great. But I have no idea where Donna is today. I have no idea. <laughs> no, she's, she's doing well. Donna, if you're out there. The whole thing. What if she yeah. gets recognized, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, man, I don't want to keep you too long. And I've covered most of the stuff I wanted to go over. So um, I'm just going to ask you the question that I've been asking everybody at the end of this, uh, this season. We have a question for the end of the episode, which is, uh, if you could be transported anywhere and any time in Earth's history, where and when would it be? And this is just for a day. You can go anywhere, you know, see the dinosaurs or go to Woodstock or whatever. Mm. I know it's a broad question, but. That's a broad question. I don't know. Maybe the, like the mid sixties would be kind of cool to check out just the cars and the, the cars and the, the gals. Drop acid know. with the Beatles. Yeah. It's just a cool time. I don't know. No, 60s, I, yeah, that I'm works. Sure. Dinosaurs would be pretty fucking cool too, actually. I'd probably rather do that. I do the dinosaur thing. Let me change that. Yeah. Well, get the only problem there is you might get fucking eaten. I know, but just imagine like, you know, if I had like a, like a laser gun or something and <laughs> I don't know, machine gun, it'd be pretty insane though. To like see, I'd probably get killed, but like it might be machine gun. Yeah. You could try some like brontosaurus meat over the fire. Oh my God. I can imagine. And like, you know, just the air, right? Like it'd be amazing. Yeah. Good answer, man. Well, I guess you gave two answers kind of, but whatever. Uh, either way, man, I really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me and, uh, and thank you again to all the fans for reaching out with the questions. Um, yeah, I hope to see more of your stuff in the future. I don't know. Do you have anything on the horizon right now you want to plug or anything? Uh, I'd be doing more still standing this winter if it wasn't for COVID. So I'm, I'm still plugging away at that show. Like, nice. in, like usually I do half a season now and some horror stuff. Uh, I've been doing a lot of recreations and uh, paranormal shows, which has been amazing. That's cool. Uh, and then some comedies. Just did a show called Decoys on CBC Gem and my Nigel's roommate. Um, but yeah, a lot of things in development. It, Canada is a tough place to make stuff, especially in COVID. But you know, nice. I'm always working on ideas. And uh, I get hired to do uh, I have a writing partner. We get hired to do uh, developments for people as well. So awesome. Um, but yeah, so- we'll sounds see. like you got a full plate. Yeah, I mean, you know, when when uh, you can't fish, mend your your nets, right? So it's yeah. like that's uh, winter's a slow time in TV, and you know, just keep trying to keep busy, being creative, you know. So, cool. Yeah, dude. Well, thanks again, man. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, chat chatting with me. I hope uh, I answer all your questions. Uh, if you oh, have any uh, any more, I got I got some more minutes for you, or. It's all good. Uh, I honestly, I, well, there was a couple that I mean, someone asked uh, who cleaned up all the goat shit in the goat episode. Oh, just the PAs and stuff. Yeah, I cut that one because, I mean, I wasn't sure, you know, like which ones would get the best answers. And so I tried to go with the ones that I thought were really, uh, you know, I don't know, just the most poignant questions. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's such a there's so much shit to talk about. You know, people want to know about, you know, the music, about like, you know, uh, I don't know, favorites and I don't know. Don even wants to know about why Donnie left. Yeah, okay. So that was one I didn't put in because everyone was asking and they're like, oh, drama. And I'm like, I don't know if you guys know how to do an interview, but like generally you don't try and piss people off. And I didn't know if that was going to be like a hot button issue. But if you want to, you know, for the record. It's it's almost like Donna. Like I don't, I I just remember, I know Kenny's always liked having Spenny isolated. And, uh, you know, as far as like interfering with shows, like we weren't allowed to, but sometimes someone would say something by accident or whatever. And I think maybe, I mean, having Spenny totally isolated, I think is a key element of doing the show. And 
I mean, maybe the optics might have been Spenny, it might have been both of them, was that you know, Don Donnie was hanging out with Spenny a lot off camera and that, you know, maybe Spenny didn't like that. Maybe he felt he was exposed himself too much, like getting a beer at a strip club after work kind of thing or mm. whatever stuff they got up to. It's like, I think, um, I think Kenny, I know has always wanted Spenny to be isolated and alienated from the crew. And like, you know, it's, it's what I find ironic is after Donnie left, you know, Kevin and Brian came in who are awesome. And I think they were like the, the best possible scenario, but then, you know, they're helping him out too. They're like, they're funny guys. They were actively involved, like, you know, coaching him for his wrestling episode. He did these short films that they were in. Like they were involved almost more than Donnie, you know? So it's one of those things. It's a subjective day-to-day thing where it's like, if you're helping Spenny in a way I don't want you to, <laughs> you're out. Or if Spenny felt like, you know, maybe, uh, um, he was exposed too much of his personal life to somebody. Maybe he might feel uncomfortable with them. I mean, you can look at the credits. We had a lot of turnover with crew for all sorts of reasons. You know, it's like a lot of people didn't, didn't want to put up with it. A lot of people we had on the show were, I think really amazing and had higher aspirations than being a PA and went on to do really cool stuff. But well, especially if you're cleaning up goat shit. (laughs) Yeah. And Donnie, like, he would have probably, he would have kept doing the show, but like I've worked with a guy since and he now really sees it as a blessing that that happened because it made him, obviously he must've felt like shit afterwards, but like it kind of made him reassess what he wanted to do. And like, he's now this amazing camera guy who like, I worked with him on a cop show and like the dude was amazing. Like he reminds me of me and that like, he's just good to go and, eager to get shit like he's not a lazy lean on something and you know type of camera guy like he wants to he wants to shoot shit he's got a great eye so like he's cut out his his niche as a camera operator now um as a result of that so like more power to him i think it's great and i i know things are cool with him and and the guys i was gonna say there's no bad blood or anything uh... no no like i've always i always wanted him to come out like when we did uh whatever when spenny did his woman gone crazy type of thing like donnie came out as like a in charge of security he came out with a wrestling episode i think he had a little uh, throw at the christmas special he's such a decent dude it's just great always great to see him and i i think like now things are totally cool i think you know it's it was such a long time ago anyways and um <laughs> yeah so you're good to hear all right man well uh i really don't have anything else at the moment but i uh thank you again so much and uh thanks for the community and and I, I think the community thanks you for doing this interview because you've told a lot of really cool behind the scenes stuff here so uh, right i really on, appreciate you sharing man cool it's good chatting with you yeah you as well anytime right, man. man right on peace out